ES Audio. Hello, this is the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis, the Standard's Chief Theatre Critic. I'm Nancy Durrant, Culture Editor. And I'm Nick Clark, Deputy Culture Editor. Coming up, Trouble in Butte Town. Plus, I'll be speaking to actor and writer Tracy Ann Oberman. My grandmother Faye and her brothers Alf and Leslie were all at the Battle of Cable Street. My great uncle Alf got pushed through the plate glass window at Gardner's Corner of this department store there by the black shirts and then beaten up by the police who were protecting the fascists and my grandma yeah. and they all went out to join them and they all threw marbles so they couldn't walk. Tracy Ann is currently starring as Shylock in The Merchant of Venice 1936 in a touring production which kicked off this week at the Watford Palace Theatre. But kicking off the show, Nick Clark and I review Romeo and Julie, yes you heard that right, starring It's a Sin's Callum Scott Howells at the National Theatre. So, Romeo and Julie, as the name suggests... Romeo. Romeo, I beg your pardon, (laughs) and Julie, as the name suggests, is inspired by uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but not, I think it's safe to say, based on it. Yes, no one uh, should be coming expecting... Uh, iambic pen- pentameter or doublet and hose <laughs> indeed no um, it's by Welsh playwright Gary Owen it's directed by Rachel O'Riordan who has a previous association with uh, with Gary Owen when they both worked together at the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff this is a co-production with the Sherman Theatre and it's about a young Welsh lad who is a young father a single father who meets a young Welsh girl and uh, well as the as you probably guess given it's inspired by Romeo and Juliet <laughs> they fall in love what bet are you doing Relativistic momentum? Yeah, classic. <laughs> it's funny you should say that. That is classic. And you will never know why. They're on very different paths, aren't they? He's basically yeah. struggling to get through each day as a very new, very young father with no money, very little help, alcoholic mother. Yeah. She is a super bright student who has been um, predicted or has been offered a place at Cambridge if she gets two A stars and an A. Uh, which she's fully expected to do. And, of course, these two star-crossed lovers collide. It's interesting. That, as you say, they're on different paths, but then they're not from totally different socioeconomic no. backgrounds. They're both working class. I mean, he comes from a much more chaotic mm. background than she does. He's effectively learning to be a parent to his daughter while also parenting his mother to mm. a certain extent. And she is, as you say, this sort of young academic superstar but mm. comes from a fairly ordinary household. Yeah, um, she's sort of two streets away, but it, it still mm. feels like another world away from him, doesn't it? He yeah. feels like he's really struggling to make ends meet, um, whereas she's got a quite a stable family uh, dynamic there. Yeah. Callum Scott Howells as Romy and uh, Rosie Sheehy as Julie, I think really just bring this play to a whole nother level. Uh, they bring so much heart, so much humanity. I couldn't stop watching them. It's very funny. It's quite sexy. It's very mm. romantic, isn't it? Mm. Um, in a way that theatre re- very rarely is. Mm. Um, I think... Um, what I thought was fascinating about this is that young unmarried parents are quite often demonised mm. in the media and by politicians, and here they are sort of, well, they're not necessarily celebrated, but it's he's asking very seriously, what does it mean mm. if you are, you know, if you are a father mm. or and a stepmother before you're in your 20s? Mm. Um, I found it particularly interesting given that now the birth rate has apparently dropped off a cliff, so mm. suddenly all those people who have been saying, don't have it, don't have mm. children, don't have children, are saying, quick, please have mm. some children who's going to look after us in the old people's home. I mean, it's all about parenting this, isn't it? Yeah. It's about, you know, one, one child has a stable background, the other one doesn't yeah um it's different forms of parenting and actually he is particularly noble in not reneging on his duties yeah and i we obviously can't spoil things that happen in the plot but once again he doesn't shy away from what happens to him he's he's a pretty i, I would say heroic character in that yeah. sense it, it surprises you at every turn mm. quite often doesn't it i think the only thing that i i was sort of a bit dubious about was um, they kept banging on about how Julie was going to go to Cambridge and study physics and I thought that was ever so slightly over age you suddenly <laughs> felt that every fifth word was Cambridge yeah, but yeah. Uh, I wondered how you, how, uh, how you related to it as a dad of fairly young children Nick uh, yeah, did well, the chapped fingers speak <laughs> to you? <laughs> uh, well certainly the first scene left me with a slight PTSD because <laughs> um, basically it's uh, Callum Scott House's character Romy attempting to change a nappy for a good five or six minutes yeah. I think possibly went on a bit long but and certainly for a, a father of a one and a half year old boy can I relate to his <laughs> uh, to his issues again it's quite a bold opening really mm. isn't it of uh, you know the first five minutes of the play as you say is mm. soiled nappy yes um, which is possibly not what your average uh, national theatre audience is expecting <laughs> but again that's a that's a a, a really great thing I think mm. uh, we should also probably mention that this is part of Rufus Norris, the artistic director of the National Theatre. It's part mm. of his policy 
to do co-productions with mm. regional theatres, make it more of a national theatre mm. rather than this sort of metrocentric blob on the South Bank, yeah. which I think has worked really well. Um, and it's, it's working twofold at the moment mm. with the Sheffield Theatre's co-production of Standing at the Sky's Edge That's on brilliant. the Olivier stage, yeah. which is wonderful. And now this in the Dorfman, the, uh, the, the, the smaller stage. But it's very authentically Welsh, I think, mm. uh, all the language, all the accents. And it's, it's, it's on a very, very human scale. There's hardly any set. There's yes. some neon signs, which mm. I think are partly to sort of suggest... Um, Sperm and egg, maybe, but also possibly. Oh, I hadn't picked that up. Ah, you might well be poss- right. Yeah. Possibly physics symbols as well, or you yeah. know, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a suggestion of sort of DNA floating around mm. uh, above the heads of these of these characters mm. in in many different senses. Um, but I agreed with you totally. It stands or falls on the on the performances of the two leads. Mm. The rest of the cast are perfectly fine. Yeah, but yeah. It's the it's those two that you have to believe in. I. Mm. Um, I really enjoyed both their performances. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I thought Rosie Sheehy has a great sort of naturalness to mm. her. Uh, Callum Scott House has a quite a he's, – he's quite heavily worked out in this. He wears yeah. cap sleeve T-shirts, doesn't he? He's got enormous <laughs> arms, which <laughs> might surprise those who saw him in uh, It's a Sin. Yeah, where he very a very sort of diffident, slightly yeah. waif-like mm. character. Um, and you sort of sense the weight of that he's resting on those – quite worked out shoulders yeah, for well, him here. And also, uh, it seemed to me, and he's quite, you know, mannered, and, and, and he feels to me like he's a, he's a kid in a adult's body. It really, uh, I think that's the performance. That's what, you know, he's 18 and he's got a kid, and you're just thinking, how is he dealing with this? Because he's a kid himself. Yeah. And I think he really, he really brings that across in his performance. Yeah. With the plotting, I mean, it's less Romeo and Juliet, a bit more Goodwill Hunting. It's sort of, <laughs> can the... Uh, super brain, uh, escape the surroundings and do it for everyone, yeah. you know, take everyone with her essentially to Cambridge. Yes, yes, you're right. I think it's, I thought it was a terrific piece of work. I agree. It was very moving. And at the end of the, the play when I was watching, it was it was absolutely quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And I think that's absolute testament to, to the performers and to the writing. OK, so two thumbs up for Romeo and Julie at the National Theatre. After the break, I'll be speaking to Tracy Ann Oberman, former RSC star who you will know from EastEnders, Ridley Road, Friday Night Dinner, and a personal favourite of mine, Toast of London. So we'll be back after these ads. Make sure you hit rate and follow. I am joined now by Tracy Ann Oberman, who plays Shylock and was instrumental in the adaptation of The Merchant of Venice 1936, which I caught this week at Watford Palace Theatre. Welcome, Tracy Ann. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. First of all, tell us how would you sum up the production? I always wanted to do a production of The Merchant. Well, I hate the play for starters. I think it's a really difficult, nasty play. It was written at a time of huge anti Semitism, and um, it causes a lot of anti Semitism because it keeps fulfilling those tropes uh, that you know about Jews being mean and stingy and just wanting blood and money lending I think it's a very difficult play and I always wanted to do a production where you had a female Shylock because I wanted to know how it informed the relationship with the daughter with her daughter Jessica and I I thought about my great grandmother and all my great aunties Machine Gun Molly and Sarah Portugal who smoked a pipe and a slash of red lipstick and my great grandmother Annie who came over from Belarus from um, the peasants you know lifestyle they lived in the Pale of Set of settlements and they came over to London to the East End and these women were often widows and they were tough as nails and they ran their businesses out of the East End of London but they only wanted their children to do better than them and so all their money went into education and that was my starting point for this and it was a it was a complete passion project for many years to try and get this off the ground right and it's set in 1936 around the time of the battle of cable street exactly it's it's um, the the weeks leading up to the battle of cable street we've taken our venetian aristocracy and we've turned them into the upper upper class oswald mosley um fascist the british union of fascist fans as we know mosley had a massive support from the, his the aristocracy not least his wife diana Mitford. Um, they got married at Goebbels's house with Hitler as a witness and Hitler taught um, Oswald Mosley and Diana Mitford everything there was to know about whipping up Jew hate to get political acumen and a foothold. What um, do you think having a female Shylock brings to the play? How does it change the dynamic of the play or the texture of the play? My own experience of standing up to anti-Semitism and receiving a huge amount of misogyny, I think it opens the play up to 
seeing what a nasty play it is because I think that the by having a female Shylock you have misogyny as well as anti-Semitism tied in there and particularly in the court scene when you have these men and two women dressed as men who turn on her and turn on her in a way that they don't need to once the bond has been destroyed they really don't need to destroy her of everything and it's like magpies you know attacking a, a sparrow it's it's a horrible nasty bullying environment and I think you see Shylock through a different prism of seeing her as a woman who's a survivor and her t- you may not like her but you understand her and I think um, yeah. as David Morrissey said to me actually it opens up that relationship of a mother and a daughter so that relationship becomes something incredibly meaningful as well so you can see just how much it destroys her when her daughter runs off and takes everything with her this has um a personal dimension for you doesn't it because your grandmother was is it was your grandmother your great-grandmother who was at the battle of Cable my Street? great-grandmother my grandmother Faye and her brothers Alf and Leslie were all at the battle of Cable Street my great uncle Alf got pushed through the plate glass window at Gardner's corner of this department store there by the black shirts and then beaten up by the police who were protecting the fascists and my grandma yeah. and they all went out to join them and they all threw marbles so they couldn't walk and I mean it was a, it was an English civil rights moment where all the working class communities pulled together on that day to protect the Jews. You play uh, your Charlotte with a very with quite a strong accent as well which sort of others her as well doesn't it, amongst these very cut glass uh, British accents that she's surrounded by. I wanted to honour the those women who had my bubba, my bubba Annie, who uh, was a great inspiration for me on this part, was a, you know, spoke with a very strong Yiddish accent all her life. She barely spoke English, really. And a lot of a lot of them still spoke it with that, that thick Yiddish accent. So I wanted to honour that. And it did mark them out as different. And those women, you know, who'd been so, I think it's the same for all immigrant families with strong, tough women, you know, you know, these women come over here, the very thing that made them survive the culture and the emigration that they had, it was that they were strong and tough and able to, to talk their way out of things and barter. And then they come to England, particularly in the 30s, where the upper classes and the upper middle, you know, the middle classes want their women to be decorative and quiet and, um, and just sort of there to look very pretty. And so these tough, strong immigrant Jewish women and others were an anathema to them. You're a, a mother to a daughter as well. Did that inform you? your playing of Shylock? Um, very much so. Uh, in, in our play, our, our, our Jessica is very young. She's 16, just turning 17. I have a 16-year-old daughter. Uh, you're my, you know, one, when you have one daughter, your relationship is very, very intense and very close. They're your absolute best friend, but your absolute worst enemy. Uh, it's a really, yeah. you know, it's a really tight, tight, tight relationship. Um, so the betrayal uh, and the smothering love and the the feeling of loss when Jessica goes, I absolutely can empathise with it. I've seen the reaction on Twitter to uh, the opening at the Watford Palace. Uh, were you gratified by the response that it got? Oh my gosh, you know, it's funny. It, it was so not a vanity project for me. It was a real, really political piece of theatre and it was so important for me to put this on. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and thinks, I'm desperate to play Shylock, but I really was. And I, I really wanted to take this play and use it as a, a you know, we've got a great education project going alongside it. I really want to help teachers to teach this play, both historically, to put the Battle of Cable Street. There was so much about this play that that meant the world to me. So, yes, to have it out there, designed, music, light, acting in the absolute way that I wanted it to be done and to have it received so positively and with so much love has meant the world to me. It really feels like the project of my life. Mm. It must have been very weird because you had to step out of uh, Noises Off in order to do uh, <laughs> The Merchant, which is a hell of a sort of d- d- double hander to be doing. It must have been very strange alternating between the two projects. Exactly. Well, I was, um, well the, look, The Merchant's been in my blood for four years. You know, I've been over every mm. single thing about this, the design, the music, the concept, working with Bridget Lam or our director. So, you know, it felt that it came from my heart. But yes, I have to say, having opened in Noises Off and doing four you know, really fun weeks in the West End, but at the same time rehearsing The Merchant was quite, 
quite a, a thing. I'm aware you started your career with the RSC and I remember those days very well. Um, it's a delight to see you back on stage because, of course, you have a, a burgeoning TV career. Is it important for you to go back to the theatre? Oh, very much. I always try and do... Um, I've always tried to do a play a year um, over the years. You know, I always try and do a piece of theatre and I do think the older that I get, the more satisfying working in theatre is because, number one, you're in charge of your own edit. Number two, you know, nobody can take away your moments where you think, why didn't you... Why did you cut away from there? Also, the immediate reaction with the with the audience feels incredibly important. And I think, you know, being on stage is an actor's medium, whereas I think screen acting is more of a director and editor's medium. Absolutely. Well, the merchants appeared in, in Watford. There are plans to hopefully bring it to somewhere slightly yeah. more central in London, somewhere fairly apt for the setting. It's been announced that it's going to the Royal Shakespeare Company and then it's going on a 10-week tour. But as part of that tour, it will be coming into central London, into the East End. And um, I don't think that's been fully announced yet, but it's a really exciting prospect and it ties in very closely to the anniversary of the Battle of Cable Street. Terrific. Well, I think it's a tremendous performance and a tremendous achievement. So, uh, well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and talking to us Thank about you it. so much, Nick. Always, always loved your writing and it's really lovely that you came to see it. Coming up, Nick Curtis and I review Trouble in Butte Town by award-winning playwright Diana Necker Atuona. If you're enjoying the show and want to hear more, hit follow and rate. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Let's get into Trouble in Butte Town at the Donmar Warehouse by Diana Necker Atuona. So it's set in an um, unlicensed boarding house in yep. Butte Town, which is in Tiger Bay. Tiger Bay is, I discover, Wales' oldest multi ethnic community right. and has been since the 19th century. Uh, and the residents of this boarding house reflect that. I'm going to whiz through them. It's set in the Second World War. Also, a very good point, yes, yep. and crucial. Yes. Uh, there's a white woman, Gwyneth, who is married to a black sailor who we actually don't meet except in a photograph. Uh, she has two mixed heritage daughters of mm-hmm. 17 and probably about, I don't know, what do you think, 10 or 11, something yeah, like that? About that yeah, I'd say, yes. Connie and Georgie. There's Norman, a ship worker from the Caribbean, and Dullah, who is, uh, shall we say, a selectively observant Muslim. Um, <laughs> his girlfriend, Peggy, although she doesn't live there, she's a black woman, and Gwyneth's older brother, Patsy. And in this kind of harmonious group, uh, multi-ethnic group, comes Nate, who is a black American GI on the run with, yes. you know consequences. Yes, indeed, yes. He's on the run, we should say, from um, a segregated American base in Cardiff, round round the docks, and the contrast is with the that the Americans have brought in their segregationist policies yeah. uh, into what is a more accommodating uh, atmosphere in the in the boarding house. It's interesting this one. I mean it's um it's kind of enjoyable but slightly sort of the whole thing feels slightly sort of engineered and slightly phony the you know the the whole setup of the whole thing. It's funny isn't it because I I saw it last night. The thing that really struck me even just in the interval was it's incredibly old fashioned. Yes. And I don't mean that just because it's in the sort of the, the Second World War uh, milieu, you know, there's definitely a kind of someone's read a lot of Chekhov, yeah. uh, you know, and there's a, a it's very competent, mm. you know, it's really yeah. nicely structured. But the sort of modernity of it, the kind of contemporary interest comes from that location. It interested me. I was glad to know that that area was extremely ethnically diverse. And I looked it up afterwards and I found out that by 1911, I think it was, the proportion of Cardiff residents that were black or Asian was second only to London. Yes. I'm glad to know that. I think yes. that's really interesting. Yes. Obviously, mostly around the docks. But but the actual the actual play itself, it feels deeply uncontemporary. It's kind of, yes. And it's kind of, as I say, lots of different confrontations are sort of engineered in it, like the fact of Dullah, the Muslim character, having this black Welsh girlfriend yeah. um, and they have these discussions where she's sort of like, oh, you're going to go home and have an arranged marriage after this. He's like, no, 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 I'm not. And then you yeah. think, I bet you are. Yeah, you, are. you clearly are. Right? <laughs> I bet you clearly are, you know, and uh, you're not going to be swinging beer like you are in this Cardiff front room. No, um, exactly. <laughs> moonshine that... Uh, that our hostess Gwyneth brews in her in her outside lab out the back of it. Um, <laughs> you can sort of see the joins of all of it, you, and you can see the arguments coming down the down the track at you, can't you? I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's very playy. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's the extent that it makes it very hard to forget that you're watching one. You know, when you're spotting the tells, hmm. the Chekhov's gun, you know, in every scene, and crucially also the red herrings for what they are. Yes. You know, there's a moment I think in the second half where. 
try to give anything away because it is, you know, it is constructed like that. There's a person who says something to another person and you are clearly meant to think, oh, I wonder if this thing will happen as a result of this conversation. But actually that that character hasn't been given the urgency for you to think that that is even vaguely plausible. And then soon after that or just before, I forget in what order it happens, somebody under pressure is mean to someone else and I immediately just leaned over to my friend and I was like, well, I know exactly what's going to happen now. <laughs> yes. She's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And lo, it did befall. It was incredibly predictable. Yeah, it kind of was, which is a shame. It's because there's a, there's there's some t- quite a lot of talent in the cast. Yeah. Quite a few of them are, are young actors making their stage debut, or some of them making their stage debuts. Yeah. It's directed by Tanuk Craig, who I think is a really terrific um, rising director. Yeah. Uh, as you say, I was delighted to 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 see into this milieu and mm. to learn more about what that was like. But it just does all feel a little bit pedestrian, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? it does. Um, and, it, you know, it's got sort of elements of thriller and moments of jeopardy, but but yeah. but you do, you feel comfortable enough knowing what's going to occur mm. that that doesn't ever quite catch. Having said that, I really enjoyed the kind of early stages of, like, unpicking the relationships between the characters. Yes. Credit to the writer, I think they are really nicely drawn. Yeah. I particularly like Norman, who's played by Zephyr and Tate, um, who, by the way, is in Call the Midwife, which everyone is always surprised to find is literally my favourite programme on telly. <laughs> he's rather wonderful. He's kind of annoying, but he's lovable, and everybody clearly, you know, just knows that when he gets on one, he's just on one, and they all just need to kind of sit it out. Yes. Um, and I think that was really nicely done. And also, I think Nate, who is the American GI, a very young man, 21, mm-hmm. I think he's played by a, a young man called Samuel Adwunmi. Yeah. And he's a really complex character, actually. He's terrified and there's a sort of level of aggression there because of the the adrenaline of his situation. He's also very polite. You know, he's from the American South and, yes. you know, he, everybody is all sir and ma'am. And he's also kind. Yeah, I'd like to say a word for Rita Bernard Shaw, who I thought was a great sort of natural stage presence, even though I believe this is her stage debut, or certainly a yeah. very early stage role. She plays uh, Connie, who is the 17-year-old daughter of Gwyneth. She stood out for me because she's got the kind of, that you know, 17 is a very interesting age for a young woman, mm. um, especially one who has not been, you know, allowed out since, you know, since her early teens. And she had the sort of the kind of petulance and childishness, particularly in the way that she deals with her younger sister, Georgie. Yeah. Um, who was ex- the child actor I saw, uh, was Rosie O'Kenna, the night right. I saw it, who was just wonderful as Georgie. Yeah. I mean, this sort of surly, petulant, uh, precocious young, right, young right. girl. She was fantastic. That relationship was very nicely done because this 17-year-old is still a child yeah. and uh, uh, up to a point, and she... You know, she essentially bullies and and behaves appallingly towards her younger sister. She regresses in the way that one does when one goes into a family situation (laughs) whenever she sees her. We've all been there. At the same time, you know, she's a growing, budding woman. She wants to join the forces. She wants to do her part. She's wants to be a singer as well. She does sing rather beautifully. Yeah, she does. But and when she's dancing. Uh, once she kind of gets over her initial awkwardness, you know, you see it in kind of teenage girls now. She's like, she's a little bit sexy. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's kind of which, uh, slightly to Norman's perturbation, I seem to remember in I the think play. That's but, right. yeah, yes, uh, yes. but it's very, you know, she's got all of those things in her at the same time as a 17 year old girl would. But that's a hard line to tread, and I think she does it really well. I agree. It's interesting. We're, um, it shows what talent there is in the younger legions of the cast that we're barely mentioning. Sarah Parrish, who is the ostensible star of this, as Gwyneth, who went, who, who uh, sailed through the whole thing like, I think, as the figurehead of a ship. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sort of cheekbones a flare. Yeah, a complete um, stately galleon throughout yes, the entire exactly. thing. Sail. You know, but kind of wonderful. Firing on her rescuers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yes. She was great, actually. You know, I really enjoyed her. She does kind of, she creates a great anchor, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, mixed feelings about... Mm. Uh, about Trouble in Butte Town, but I think certainly entertaining and with a lot, a lot to unpack. Yeah, and a lot of potential, I think. Yeah. That's it for this week's episode of the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. I'm Nancy Durrant. And I'm Nick Clark. We'll be back next Sunday. Make sure you hit rate, follow and leave us a review. See you soon. <laughs>